the, if we take if we can take 20 minutes or so and you may all have questions for each other or observations you want to make about what you've heard there is one question so far but if the audience wants to add anything else in the q a the the question that's already there i've got some others that i'm going to throw in um but i think this is from philippa I think this might be to you, Glenn, if I've understood it correctly. It's it's great that you have made the trails accessible. There are, however, still barriers for some people. Will there be videos of some of these trails and other projects? Yeah, I think over, over time we will um, look to um, for the other projects to, to take a similar sort of route, both from a, a kind of a, an access point of view, um, but also from kind of sharing that and documenting it and, you know, getting that message out as widely as possible. Um, I think on, on access, we do, there is a, there is a kind of a natural tension between areas of high ecology and people. They don't always go terribly well together and particularly where you've got kind of ground nesting birds and things like that. So we do have to make sure that the access is in the right place um, and, that people are kind of respecting, um, you, you know, the the environment they're in. But there's ways, there's kind of subtle ways of doing that. Thanks, Glenn. Oh, uh, you again. Other people might have other questions, and but I thought I'd just throw in a very big question to begin with because Alicia started talking about this at, at the beginning, really the 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 kind of conflict between capitalism and the planet. One of, one of the things I thought was very interesting about the talks in a way was we had a, a little bit like, maybe capitalism isn't right, the right word, but there was a little bit of like good capitalism and bad capitalism in those talks. Because I heard Glenn really talking about responsible landowners, responsible farming. And I heard um, Louise talking really about irresponsible profiteering. And I just wondered whether all four of you really might have some reflections on yeah the role of money the role of property the role of business i don't know there are different words and concepts in play here aren't there but what's the what's going on that we can in one in one talk we can hear about actually very responsible behavior by landowners and people as glenn said trying to make a living make a profit um, but on the other hand, we have examples of kind of profiteering, which which seems to be totally without justification, nothing but exploitation. What's going on and what as a society should we be doing to maybe shift towards good capitalism or something else, if that's not quite the right word for it? Any, any And I, I don't know, I've thrown that such a big question in there, but if any, yes, <laughs> Rebecca, take it off. <laughs> I think it's quite a, a lot to take on 30% rewilding Britain um, and capitalism, but <laughs> um, but I, I've got a few reflections. I think there um, are some dynamics um, in terms of, um, well, financing of nature-based solutions, for instance, that include rewilding um, carbon credits, biodiversity credits that could be could potentially be a force for good, but could also uh, not be, as in fund, uh, uh, you know, uh, be counterproductive. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is um, for the, you know, for those that are wanting to rewild, um, what what is out there in terms of funding and financing, uh, and how can they access it? But also for those that are providing the finances, financing, what standards should they be working? To, to ensure that both they actually achieve rewilding. Uh, you know, there's a lot of examples where people are accessing funding and are just planting, you know, planting trees in inappropriate places and not achieving biodiversity gains and claiming carbon credits, for instance. There are lots of examples where, um, you know, in, in essence, those who already have capital and land are able to access those uh, sources of funding and financing, but local communities or community owned land or you know clusters of uh, landowners for instance find it really difficult to access so i think we'd like to see um just as as much as there's a sort of spectrum of rewilding ecologically from those sort of remoter wilder areas where you might have you know 
top predators and a mixture of herbivores and um, you, much like some of the national parks that you see in, in the States, for instance. Um, I think there's also a, a sort of spectrum of kind of community involvement and participation and governance of, of rewilding. So you might, uh, you know, it's not to say that those who to own la large amounts of land can't make a really valuable contribution, but we'd like to see it much more possible for um, community-led projects or common land or um, clusters of landowners, um, smaller landowners, be able to access the support and financing and funding that is available. And we'd like we'd like to see kind of nature-based enterprise zones so that you know we can start to see much more locally orientated enterprises linked to rewilding and nature's restoration um, that supports local communities and helps sustain them. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, I'm quite up for tackling rewilding and capitalism, but I think there are um, you know elements of that that we'd like to see um, happen much more community-led, locally local decision making. Um, and much more considered support um, for those types of approaches. Thanks, Rebecca. Who, any, I, yeah, Louise. Have a go too. I think yeah, you're you're right, Rebecca. In that the power is feels very much in in communities to make sure that it's kind of well managed. And I think that's what Glenn was talking about as well. Is like is making sure that communities who really care about that area and, and want to invest in that area and support it and, and see it as well as making profit also being able to kind of, they really care about the landscape itself and making sure that it's going well. I think, as you were saying, um, in terms of what, what I do, um, we do see a really dirty side of, of capitalism, but, but in terms of as well, it's just useful to point out. So water companies are currently a monopoly, um, a very poorly regulated monopoly. Um, and so it's kind of the worst end of the capital spectrum in terms of um, it's not managed in the way that capitalism is kind of supposed to be managed even in itself. So it's particularly poor um, example of what's going on because um, we've got these individual bodies that are responsible and have been given infrastructure that they don't necessarily feel like they have to take ownership their the shareholders who own them aren't really very involved a lot of the shareholders like over 60 percent of shareholders of water companies across the um the uk are, are not from the uk because it's such a profitable thing to be invested in and quite a stable thing to be invested in because at the moment there's very poor regulation on what's taken out of the system um and what's actually reinvested and, and what the responsibility of the water companies are to kind of protect our waterways and that kind of thing so i think it's the reason it's such an example of the way capitalism is so poor is that monopoly based system, which is which is kind of a, a rarer thing than than I guess um, is is not the same as what Glenn and, and Rebecca are talking about in terms of or particularly what Glenn's working on. Um, and so that's why it's such a problem in what we're up to. Thanks, Louise. Glenn, what, what, why, why? Oh, Alicia wants to come in. We'll let Alicia come in, and then, okay. then you can, then you can look at it from your perspective. Okay. Alicia, what did you want to say? Your microphone's off. You... Um, we we had the example from um, Jeremy of his regenerative farm when he was clear that funding was definitely needed for the transition. He needs funding to plant trees and do all the other things he's doing. But he feels that once his farm is uh, working properly and he's managed to reduce um, even more the, the use of fertilizers and I don't think he uses fertilizers. He uses some pesticides still, but he's been reducing them. Once, once the transition is complete, he feels that his individual farm should be able to work as a normal business, selling food to the local community and doing all sorts of other community things. So in that level, um, capitalism can exist. Um, but long-term funding is needed for the to redress the state we've got in. But I think an another way of looking at it is that um, capitalism just has failed the planet. 
And what we need is um, the donut economy, which um, supports people within the limits of the planet. And, and so that sort of capitalism that we've got of, of continuous growth on a finite planet has to go. Um, the trouble is we've got to get there using the present um, capitalist system. We've got to get the transition to, to a, a donut economy that cares for people um, and the planet, but we've got to use get there from our, our, our present position. And I think that, that'll be quite tricky. I mean, I want to talk to lots of um, economic experts to find out how they think the tap, cap, present capitalist system can fund um, the change without causing market chaos. Thanks, <laughs> Glenn, there's not a lot of pressure on you here, just mm, well, I don't I don't disagree with um much of what Alicia has said actually. And I think it, you know, I've used the, the word pragmatism quite a few times, but um it's kind of perverse that the the mechanisms that have caused the the mess and the and the problems with the planet and biodiversity and everything else are the same mechanisms that we're now turning to to redress that. Um but we we understand that, you know, I think this you summed it up quite well. We need to use some of those tools within that capital, capitalist society to try and pump prime the whole process of, of returning kind of nature back to the landscape. And it's, it's quite shocking that within the UK, you know, our, our biodiversity indices are, are so poor for, a, you know, a relatively modern and and kind of well you know secure um society and economy i think the the game changer that we're starting to see is that um there's a there's a realization against uh, sorry there's a realization amongst um a lot of those um big sort of corporate entities that actually natural capital is 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 their lifeblood and i think governments understand that now as well and that's been the big shift within the last maybe the last decade but certainly within the last few years that actually natural capital being all of the things that nature gives us for free and 50 percent of all of the world's economy something like 44 trillion dollars are highly dependent on those natural processes so i think big finance is starting to understand that you can't continue to erode that natural capital position long term with you know you're just going to lose all of the gdp and all of the world's economy and you kind of kill the goose at low to go next so that's why partly why we're starting to see this injection of money back into nature and natural capital and i think our responsibility is to make the best of that and make sure that that's done in a a sustainable way and that we hold organizations to account and government has a part to play in that as well a big part and we're starting to see a few policies so rebecca mentioned biodiversity net gain and things like that nutrient neutrality obviously affects um, water quality and um you know ultimately the oceans as well so some of those some of those policies actually underwrite a market for this stuff and that starts to enable more investment to flow into that which gives us the ability to and uh, invest in nature and we we do need an injection of money to to do that I, I think there's a there's a bigger picture um you know government have that responsibility to have policies for the long term so government tend to work in five-year election cycles nature doesn't it's that you know that's part of the problem that's always been part of the problem that governments feel that you know it's we can do this now and get the votes because this you know the the impact will be somebody else's problem further down the line well we are already further down the line and we're sort of facing a crisis so how do we how do we urgently address that um as as kind of you know we're taking risks as landowners by doing this we really need government to have our back on on this and we're trying to put in a kind of a, a finance model which will last in perpetuity it goes down generations we're building a legacy it goes you know beyond me 
to my children, their children, other landowners that, that come into this. And one of our advisors describes it quite nicely that, you know, uh, new tree neutrality for argument's sake is a policy which which protects water quality which is a, is the solutions are bound into 125 years well if you go back 125 years queen victoria was sitting on the throne and if you look at how the world has changed in that length of time it, you know you're asking us to to kind of risk our assets based on that kind of time frame and if you if you sort of think forward that's that's a big ask so where's where's the guarantees from government that these policies will still be in place in 10 years time let alone 125 years time so that would be that would be our ask the other thing just quickly is is maybe to think about you know whole supply chains and how those supply chains work so we know that farming is having a detrimental effect on the landscape, the water quality, um, you know, and ultimately the eroding that natural capital. But they're kind of they've, they've been encouraged into that system over over decades um, with cheap food and um, you know subsidies and and there's multiple reasons for it. There's no kind of silver bullet. But actually, when you stand back and and look at the cost of that. Um, the cost of that cheap food on both health and the environment, it's a big number. So if you look at the, what the NHS spends on um, diabetes, and particularly two type, type 2 diabetes, compared to the amount of money that's being invested in food, we need to look at these, these numbers in the whole and not just focus on component parts of it, because actually it might be cheaper to... To, to look at more kind of regenerative systems and maybe even subsidizing that, but getting people eating better quality food with higher nutrient density, that, you know, not polluting, you know, putting wheat into chicken farms that, that are kind of, um, you know, polluting the water courses and, and then that stops planning and building and growth and everything else. The economic impact of that is massive for something that's a relatively, you know, um, small affair so so a follow-up question that, to flip it round, really and you've all touched on this in your talks but i suppose the kind of compensating mechanism for perhaps short-term government um or greedy corporations i mean louise covered this in a ways but it, our citizens themselves aren't they and mm -hmm. and actually louise you were talking very clearly about strategies for engaging citizens but you've all touched on that in a way, haven't you? How do you, how do you make these ideas something that people care about, turn up for, put pressure on governments if governments like ours are not very responsive? How do you think about that, perhaps each in your own different ways? Uh, the citizen angle, really, the way in which you connect to citizens. Um, Should I go first on this one? Thanks, Louise. Yeah, well, I guess that is who we are and, and what we do and what we do really well is making sure that we're engaging people through the whole process and the whole conversation on what's going on and listening to people as well and making sure that we're hearing what people have got to say in terms of what they're experiencing, what they're seeing and, and finding that to be honest, the people who are looking at what's going on on the ground are actually the people, the public particularly, are the ones who really know the best of what's going on and, and can provide some really good solutions. And so that's really what we see it as. It's more of like a harnessing that power of people um, and that knowledge from people as well and really like showing them how to use that and bringing that to the fore and, and bringing that together. And through that, we find that, we we have a really powerful impact and and make really powerful change and that's through the the bringing people with us you know we're not telling anyone to do something we're kind of bringing people with us and that's what we it's it's just crucial for how we see that we can make change thanks louise yes Rebe rebecca um i mean i think it's a really good question and um my background i worked in overseas development for 10 years in in mexico uganda and the pacific and what surprised me when I came back to the UK is how little, I mean, participatory decision-making is just part of the way community development is done overseas and has been for 30 years, um, including kind of catchment partnerships, planning at a river catchment level and um, 
watershed management and and uh, that just hasn't translated back into the UK. I mean, I worked for a while for Oxford City Council and their communities and neighbourhoods team. And, um, and, and I'd ideally like to see a national conversation about what we're asking of the land, citizens assemblies, for instance. In fact, they have done one recently called the People's Plan for Nature, um, um, involving, you know, people more broadly and then establish a sort of national land use framework, which they are aiming to do. But um, again, to, to address that issue, what and I'd like to see rewilding just mainstreamed within that. Um, um, but that then should be translated down to the local level. So people feel much more engaged uh, in developing plans for how at the local level they're going to um, kind of uh, decide how the land should be used and what should be prioritised um, so that people, again, feel that they have more of a say. Uh, I'd like to see much more community ownership of land or community involvement in land. I'd like to see um, Scotland's community right to buy um, uh, brought into England and Wales. I'd, I'd, I'd actually like to see a lot more kind of, I don't know if it's, you want to call it nationalisation of land, but a sort of national land fund so that if land comes up for sale, that um, it, it could be bought for the nation and that we could gen genuinely have national parks um, where people can still live and thrive and um, communities can be sustained. But I think we need to start to, you know, the urgency of the change that is needed requires um, kind of big visions and um, big changes, I suppose, a, a just transition. Thank you. Alicia, Glenn, Alicia. Oh, sorry, go on, Alicia. Um, go, go on, Glenn. I was just going to add education to that mix as well. So I think education is really important. And, we, and you know, go right down to primary school level to people understand where food comes from, what the impact is on the environment, and how to change, you know, because that's where the pressure comes from on the parents. And then as they, as those children grow up, they want, you know, they're, they become voters and citizens in their own right that, that push for change. So education in this is is kind of critical, I think. I would completely agree with that. I've got a daughter who's the final year of primary and she, they've spent the whole year cramming them for SATs yeah. um, at a school when they've got a lovely a kind of quite wild area with a river running through it. They're not they're not doing forest school. They're doing SATs cramming. And you just think, what's the point of it? Mm -hmm. I was going to ask Louise a question, actually, if that's OK, in the few minutes that we've got left. I mean, I'd love to hear, because I think the there's a huge overlap in in what we do in the sense that I mean a lot of I mean as Glenn has also said a lot of the pollution that's going into our rivers is from intensive agriculture in addition to sewage and I know your surf is against sewage so that you know but I, I was wondering um what emphasis you place on that or what plans you have to try and address that type of pollution going into our rivers so you know the river Y, for instance is far chicken farms a far bigger issue than sewage for instance and similarly agricultural runoff and dairy farms um is is that something that you're working on i would say it's a bit of a yes and a no i think we're um i guess partly what we're trying to do is make sure that we're sparking this conversation about the quality of water that we have across the UK and explain the reasons that we're in this position, which is also reflected within the sewage industry is also really big within the agricultural industry, right? We've got like really poor regulation, particularly in terms of how land is used um, in terms of particularly runoff and all that kind of thing we know there's there's huge problems with um the way land's managed to stop that um and like it's really cool to hear glenn talking about that as well um but i think in terms of what we're actually doing um we're i think it's also what you're talking about rebecca in terms of like nature-based solutions we're seeing the problem of sewage and agricultural runoff as kind of one and the same in terms of our, the way our land is is hugely um like we've got 
really uncomplex ecosystems that can't manage the the water that they're that the rain that they're seeing and the flooding and that kind of thing and then also um so i guess we're partly just talking about nature-based solutions to this problem so a big thing that we're pushing for is trying to um provide land that is actually absorbing water better and and reducing the amount of runoff that we're seeing that goes into sewage systems but also that's actually just runoff from agricultural systems as well and so we're trying to have that conversation but i guess i agree with you in terms of agriculture is a huge problem and, and it's something that we're constantly thinking about but we are kind of trying to make our part of the puzzle work well um and really particularly because we know that there's only 12 water companies across the uk really focusing on those 12 that we see we can have a really big impact and then hopefully we'll solve that and maybe we'll really focus on pushing um lots of different farmers and and the kind of more complex system that's going on there i think that's really where we're seeing we see ourselves in that problem if that answers yep. it. probably not the perfect answer what you wanted to hear but no, it's it's and it's realistic. It's like trying to tackle rewilding and capitalism at the same time. You've got to kind of and focus on what you can do well. Oh, uh, just you might be interested in a project actually that's starting here in Sheffield, uh, which is uh, creating a legal personhood for the River Don. So that's another way into this, I suspect, is to look at the yeah the legal status, the uh, the incorporation of natural entities and giving them ways of actually um, obviously working in partnership with human beings is required, but actually there's some really interesting models uh, that, that we could build on and there's some good international examples we could build on to create uh, a way of holding um, some of these people to account and some of these systems to account. If anybody is interested, then um, I can put you in touch with the people leading that project in Sheffield um alicia did you want to come in i think i saw you yeah um i just think that um developing grassroots policies is the way to bring people together uh, and make demands uh, and i'd i'd uh, point to the uh situation across europe where the dm25 which is democracy in europe movement has been um using widespread conversations um to develop grassroots policies and there a green new deal for europe um, has has um, got to the basis of making sure people are informed um, people and that um, funding comes from local communities and those sorts of big changes are, are what would make a huge difference here and help grassroots things to um, have the power for action. So I, I think grassroots policies are a very, very good way of, of um, giving us power, giving people the power they need. And on that note, then, should is there any like last message from everybody, like for in a kind of 30 second kind of call out before we finish? Does anybody just want to? Well, each, could each of you just say, you know, your the the final thing you'd like people to think about as as we finish tonight? Um, I'll go first off the back of your Alicia, just in that, yeah, it's people, people have the power, right? It's the people that can can make a change in this and the people who really connected to community and, and particularly the planet and really want to use and are really involved in nature. And, and it's that kind of reciprocal and understanding of what nature has and, and what they can take from nature and what they want to give back um, is a really important part of this. And, and as we say, that's kind of where we're focusing on making sure that people feel empowered to make change. Thank you, Louise. Glenn? Go if you like. Yeah, I'd, I'd also add to that that people have a responsibility. So I think we're, we're all guilty of, uh, you know, imperfections as well. So I, I just you know it's very easy to to blame previous generations and um you know my kids are great at it but they still leave the lights on so <laughs> take, take responsibility for your own actions as well as encouraging others thanks glenn and um, all i would say well you know for me rewilding is a story of hope which is why i love working in rewilding but it's also if we learn from the way that nature works it's it's a system, it's an ecosystem, and we've got to stop as people trying to 
break everything down into the silos and different parts. It's, you know, it's either forestry or farming or or conservation and start thinking in systems like like nature does uh, and embrace complexity because um, otherwise, you know, change is just not going to happen on the scale that we need need it to. Thank you so much. Alicia, last thought. Um, I think we've got to um, link all the problems. At the moment, we are in our silos. And um, I think we've got to, um, people feel helpless, which is why they don't get involved. They think they can't change. But if we join together, realizing um, that social ills and, and environmental damage are the same, come from the same root, and then we, if we um, work together, I'm sure we can uh, get there. I think it's the only way we'll get there. Well, for Citizen Network, that all makes sense. Be responsible, I agree with Glenn, but take action, I agree with Louise. Think about the whole thing, but cooperate and work together. That's citizenship as far as I'm concerned, so... Thank you all for that. <laughs> and thank you for giving up a little bit of your evening, for helping us educate others. I've certainly learned tons from all of this and we'll do our best to get the message out and we'll carry on working with Alicia. As I say, stay connected to Citizen Network if you can, if it's of interest. We, we host loads of materials on our website. We share lots of things through our newsletter and social media and we're interested in anything we can do to help create a better world and to create a world where everyone matters and everything matters. So thanks everyone. Good night. Enjoy Thank your tea you. if you've not had Bye. it yet.